Welcome, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today at the Billie Jean King Main Library with the Long Beach Public Library. Got people still entering the room. Going to start in just a second. Okay. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Angela Scott, and I am the library assistant here at the Billie Jean King Main Library's Miller Special Collections Room. On behalf of our senior librarian of collection services, Jade Wheeler, our special collections librarian, Jeff Whalen, and all the staff here at the Long Beach Public Library, I'd like to welcome you to the first online event of the Miller Room's Spoken Word, Spoken Art series, celebrating poetry and the spoken word. Today, we're pleased to bring you a special poetry and conversation event with surrealist poet, Will Alexander, moderated by Woodbury University professor, Mike Songson, AKA Mike the Poet. This is one of a series of programs that will be featured periodically in the Miller Room throughout the year. In addition to a variety of lecture series on local history, architecture and historic preservation, arts and culture, as well as our poetry and fiction writing workshops, Miller Room Book Club and Short Story Reading Group, art programming, Miller uh, musical performance programs, and much more. So please keep an eye on our LBPL calendar and website for upcoming events. And we hope you'll join us again for more of these special programs as they become available. Now, why, while we have you all here, we'd also like to mention some upcoming Miller Room programming for May. On Saturday, May 15th, from 2.30 to 4 p.m., please join us for our next Miller Room Book Club meeting. In honor of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we'll be reading The Refugees, a collection of short stories published in 2017 by Viet Thanh Nguyen, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2016. And we'll be exploring poignant stories of immigration, family, love, and identity in the experiences of Vietnamese refugees to America. The Miller Room Book Club reads a rotating selection of fiction and nonfiction books, as well as short stories that generally focus on the Miller Room's study topics and special collections relating to the arts and performing arts, Asian culture and heritage, local and California history, libraries and archives, and much more. This book club is currently meeting online via Zoom and pre-registration RSVPs are necessary. So for more information or to join the Miller Room Book Club's emailing list, visit our LBPL website at www.lbpl.org and sign up via the program's Eventbrite link on our homepage or event calendar. Or you can message me here in the live chat or call the, li the main library for further details. In addition, we are also pleased to launch our new arts and culture lecture series this May in honor of Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So please join us on Saturday, May 22nd from 3 to 4 p.m. for this inaugural online program entitled, entitled Many Islands, Many Stories, exploring Oceania or arts tradition and heritage with the Pacific Island Ethnic Art Museum, presented by the museum's director and curator, Fran Lujan. Join us for an engaging afternoon as we explore the diverse cultures, histories, and artistic legacies of our Pacific Islander community here in Long Beach and further afield. So again, please visit our website and event calendar to sign up for the Zoom program. Advanced signups are available now online and stay tuned for other Miller Room programs that we'll be rolling out in the next few months. Finally, the Long Beach Public Library kicked off a new 50 book challenge back in January. We're only four months into the calendar year. So if you've made a resolution to read more books in 2021, this is a great way to do it. So check out our website to learn more and have fun reading, earning prizes and checking goals off your list. Now, getting back to our program for today. It is our pleasure to once again, welcome and introduce our featured guests this afternoon, Will Alexander and Mike Songson. Will Alexander is a poet, essayist, novelist, playwright, aphorist, philosopher, visual artist, and pianist. His latest work published in 2021, The Combustion Cycle, is part of a rich tapestry of writing that is now approaching 40 titles in these same genres. The Combustion Cycle explores shamanism from differing regions of the globe, including the Andes, Angola, and the Asiatic wellspring that is India. And as our special guest, we're looking forward to hearing more about his work today. 
Mr. Alexander was born in Los Angeles and earned a BA in English and creative writing from the University of California at Los Angeles and has taught at many colleges and universities, including the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics, the University of California and Hofstra University, among others. He's been awarded an American Book Award and has also been honored with a Whiting Fellowship for Folk Poetry, a California Arts Council Fellowship, and the 2016 Jackson Poetry Prize. He's currently poet in residence at Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center in Venice, California, and he still resides in Los Angeles, where he has remained a lifelong resident. Now, Mike Songson was born at St. Mary's Hospital right here in Long Beach and is a third generation LA native who has lived his entire life in Los Angeles County. He grew up riding his bike around El Dorado Park and down the San Gabriel River through East Long Beach. Following his graduation from UCLA in 1997, he's published over 500 essays and poems and his poetry celebrates Southern California history and geography. Mike has an interdisciplinary Master of Arts in English and History and he's taught at Cal State LA, Southwest College, and is currently a professor at Woodbury University in the San Fernando Valley. In addition to writing poetry and performing across the Southland, he enjoys sharing his gifts and talents as a poet, scholar, and mentor with hundreds of young writers across Southern California. A number of pieces in his book, Letters to My City, also celebrate Long Beach sites like Cambodia Town, Bixby Knolls, North Long Beach, and Retro Row. His essays have been recognized by the LA Press Club and he's published widely with KCET, the Academy of American Poets, Poets and Writers Magazine, and dozens of other publications. In today's program, Mike will be guest moderating our poetry and conversation together. And as we delve into the world of avant-garde surrealist poet poetry, among other things, Mr. Alexander will also be presenting readings from his newest book, The Combustion Cycle, as well as other poems from his vast repertoire of work. At the end of the program, if there's time, we'll also have a Q&A session that will be moderated by Mike through the chat. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat bar and you'll see a chat button at the bottom of your screen and you can type and submit your questions there. And your questions will be answered as time permits. The program will officially end at 4 p.m. And if you need to leave, um, you're welcome to do so, but otherwise, please stay and continue asking questions via um, uh, the chat until about 4.15. We'll also be sending out an email in the future with a link to the archived video recording of this program, so you can watch it later at your leisure. Finally, if you're having difficulty with your audio or video during the program, please let us know in the chat so we can try to assist you remotely. So thank you again for joining us today, everyone. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the Miller Room is very pleased to present our very special guest, Will Alexander. Well, Will, it's great to see you. Same here and same to you back. You know, I just wanted to start our conversation off with a quote of yours, one of my favorite quotes <coughs> of yours from Compression and Purity, your book from City Lights. Okay. And I love it when you say, my feeling is that language is capable of creating shifts in the human neural field, capable of transmuting behaviors and judgments. Humans conduct themselves through language, and when the latter transmutes, the human transmutes. I, I love how you talk about these shifts and breakthroughs that language creates. And um, right off the bat, I just wanted to kind of kick off our conversation with uh, the way we always talk about language making breakthroughs and, and how your work is really about, about those breakthroughs. Yeah. It's, it, language, as you said, quite rightly, it, it comes like a, it, it's, it's the irrigation that springs up from what I call not, uh, almost no, nothingness. And it's a magical, and then it's a magical eruption from which, you know, wellspring. And what you do is, what you do is like participate in that eruption immerse yourself in that eruption and it's natural it's not like something you can create from a textbook or some kind of uh, a theory it's something that, that you feel that you experience and and and, and you have no other way of, of addressing that feeling except to uh script it to write it down not a kind of a dictation so to speak a natural surrealism an indigenous surrealism not an ideological surrealism yeah, we were talking earlier about um, the, the mentality of the indigenous world. 
and, of course. And, for t- and fertility. And um, so today we're going to hear a, a whole cycle of poems from you. And um, where, uh, which, where shall we begin? Well, I'm going to start with the uh, piece. It was it was how can I? It was written some years before the combustion cycle, but it it, it anticipated the combustion cycle. Yeah, the combustion cycle uh, was sired, I guess, maybe in this poem from above the human derv domain. Okay. The book I wrote more about 1999. Okay. It was published in 1999. And this is entitled The Iridescent Enigma. And it's the voice of a hummingbird that's speaking. And the, the, the Andean, it's called the Andean Hill Star. It's the second largest hummingbird on earth. And uh, this is the, the poem. And we'll start from here. By the way, the, the hummingbird is speaking. So as an indigenous person, I I feel language, not just no language or attempt to know language. But this is the bird, uh, the the hill star speaking. In this smokeless harrier desolation, I I have surmounted inscrutable errata under two electric polar moons shifting between the colors of slate blue and magenta. I, the Andean hill star, Hovering in these Martian X-ray waste, the iridescent enigma, my centripetal wings beating against the soul of cartographical sarcis, with its innervated dis- dis- distension, with its migrating sun loss. The triple atmosphere corroded by tense elliptical static, by the drainage from barbarous glacial nerves, so that the surge of countless f- uh, contentions of Phobos make the human staggering genetic less and less a factor where ciphers are beheaded. Humankind now tending to gaze from a portico of gangrene, from model as nervous collective. So I am alone, having absorbed isolation, having absorbed the general coloration of imbalance, isolated by planet, from Augustus Lumicellus, from Lofurnus Magnifica, in an alien enigma, alone, I have left the earth and its species incapable of rescue of dazzling vapor which transmutes, which allows the watery chemicals to rise and take on the wisdom of vertical misnomer of the acid which would blend with the aerial oxide of waters with prepotent force of natural helium speech which implodes, which transcends present character, constricted as it is by anorexia and debris. Its retention corrosively split into oblong grain, which ceases like a bleak Siberian witch in tragic forms of respiration. Its sodium kindled by fractions, which torment, which hounds the aspiration as to apogee, as to consuming volation. So I, as hummingbird, as expanded broach points in the blood, seeking elongation and task, which conflagrates inertia. Again, task, so that illuminates snake through the cells, no longer palpable as visual largesse, as silken sanguinary spectrums to be bled and negatively fed to half learned upheavals. I who now live above the liminal burst which exists between that which flies and that which stays sullied. No, I am not marooned on ophthalmic plateaus cartographically contained as though Peru were the only distance, the only material diamond to be breathed, to be absorbed as exclusive monomial clarity. So the barrenness, the solemn gamma ray gradations, the probing snows on Olympus mines with its scattered rays, with its geometric diamonds congealed in the orbit of black and sphinxian diameter, which gives me claim to magical fluxation and mist so that my five former bodies example 
gives to my aura a fabled and disciplined marker and a glance which traces odor according to hieroglyphic substance capable of plentitudes and aggressions capable of neurological disaffirmatives. Here I am woven by gravitational nobility, yet a free and cold space known throughout the yellow Saturnian inveiglements or, the, or across the Uranian methane formations or in the orc configuration where a basic elevation is open, where pre-turpentine trilling of the living and the living dead are both broadened and destroyed. So that the atmosphere on an earthly debility of garrisons becomes a canceled habitat for being. Yes, for dense and offensive procurement so that the Holocaust tribes, the central extermination of salt is no longer that which will flower in a post-racial chemist being the aboriginal darkness which pre-exists time. Again, the invisible fever which opens in the being a random helium morale, a pitch of negrito, of a cinder inside a cinder which post exists the inverse called by gross existence, pre-directional Eden. So that one can never explain the pure charisma of my zodiac, the instant bell of my zodiac, under the Christian law of simple post-mortem carnage. Never a blame cast by twists and thickets de-invaded and then annulled by natural solar crystallization between varied, varied shifts and different antimonies of creation. Here I am, graspless, a comedic eclipse incantation which overcomes the vile by he who migrates from nectar, who unmingles barley, by he who detracts weight. Man, that is that piece kind of connected to the my interior vita from compression and purity too. Yeah, everything is connected, but not in a um, not in a lateral linear way. But it, it, it surprises me because it always comes up fresh. It doesn't come up like a. I'm going to connect this part to that part, but they just magically appear. And I, it, after, after I've written them, I do notice there's some kind of resonance there, but I, I don't naturally script it like that at all. I love this line you said in uh, the My Interior Vita, I was born under Leo under its signpost of he. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was born uh, 727 at 11.05 at, at night. So there was this uh, triple sevens. Seven, seven, oh, seven. <laughs> yeah, all the sevens are working. So, but you know, to me, it, it, as Sri Aurobindo says, at a certain level of consciousness, one can overcome the zodiac. So that's the principle I'm working on. Not that I'm trapped in the zodiac, but I'm trying to overcome the zodiac through the experience of living. Expansion of time and space, right? Exactly. And language is the greatest way to do it. So to, to transmute that and work with it as 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 a is is just like people work in terms of building homes or you know working in sawdust. I'm working in ether. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working in this language e of ether, and that's it gets you in trouble sometimes in in a materialistic culture. But it's okay. It's you okay. know, and, uh, the combustion cycle is wow. You know, it's nearly six hundred pages. Um, there's a lot of mathematical formulas in here. Yeah, it's, it was it just accrued, you know, uh, over time, you know. Uh, I just started that, actually working that, on that book in the Pasadena Library. It's a way to escape at that time the, the issues I was going through. And uh, not, not a, as an escape, but it's experience of other levels other than the quotidian circumstance that everybody seems to be confronted with in one way or another, but not to disavow them, but to transmute them through, through uh, language and through poetry. It's what I do all the time with work. I'm always working to transmute life. There's so many different levels of, of reality in your pieces. Like there's the, you know, there is like beyond just historical, cultural, personal, but like, you know, time and space, there's, geographic references but then there's references to galaxies and um chemicals and just so many different elements mingle and merge within 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 your work 
Yeah, we've been we've been taught to segregate all these levels of knowledge and, and put them into a little container. And you know, even the so-called the security agencies talk about certain states of mind they want to do to get out of the uh, out of the linear, but at the same time they want to impact those levels and put them back into the linear, which makes makes it confusing and really doesn't work. Uh, I, what do they call it? It's something about uh, taking, they call it, they have a certain term about that in the security agencies about the placing the cognitive back into the linear, but it, it, it really doesn't work. It seems not to be working and you don't have a touch like a, like a shaman would have a touch about knowing what plant goes with this and goes with that and how, how the temperature of the human mind is working on in an, in, in an individual at a certain moment, you know, so he could, heal that person or in inject that person with insight. And you're right about, uh, they're always trying to separate the subject and the object, right? When it's really all one thing. It is one thing. And it's, it, it's a form of uh, attempted dominance, which has been working for some time and you know, thousands of years, but it's not a, uh, it's not a permanent kind of uh, solution they are look, always looking for solutions not experience of, of, of the activity of, of living all the time that living is we're subsequent to living it's already been taken care of without us you're, you're like a poetic hacker you're hacking the matrix through poetry well yeah we've got to do something with it you know that's what we're here for really is not to send up signals to a to a computer screen. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yeah. Let's uh what's uh let's hear another one. What's another uh what's another poem should we hear? Okay. This is one I'm fairly comfortable reading. It's called a Nexus of Phantoms. It's from my uh, New Directions book of uh 2009. It's from the Sri Lankan Loxodrome. Mm. And I read this quite this poem quite regularly. It's called A Nexus of Phantoms. In a lower key cave, motions of exist of disintegrated swans in a translocated lake, brimming with harvested poisons, sealed by corruptive postmortems. Such swans staggered by microbial reasoning, their aggressive nest, anatomical with anomaly with gifts of strenuous incarnating meanings, with a thirst which hurdles conspiratorial invasives, alive with the coronal oceanics, open like a clouded trail of rendings. Analogous with the auks, the pelicans, the merganches, perhaps with the petrels and the gannets, under the power of darted mocking orations. The swans, looking back on solemn blood perusal, like a form of death breaking roses on a shore, it is the example of phonograms of lost and compacted lenses turning within a charismatic fall line or an isonet or what an avian would announce in Greenland as a catapotic wind. The swans, like a haze of magnetism or implied gondola locations where the scent of each lorikeet is consumed and brought to dazzling eclipse refulgence. In another foci, in another depth, their form self-challenged in a cloak of suns, their power de-revealed with seven moons burning, reduced to two intense incendiary magnets. And these incendiary magnets, like a nexus of phantoms, scattered across a geometric optometry. You know, uh, the poems I write are of a whole. It's not like this poem is over here, not that writing, but it's just this one mass, like the cosmos itself. Um, and within that mass, you know, you have particular instance of that mass and going this way and going that way. But as a whole, the energy that comes into my energy of writing is is, is from that same source. It's not a uh, it's not a bifurcated. The grain is not bifurcated. It, it has all the nutrients. I try to have all the nutrients in it, not my, by my consciousness, but by the fact of the way that I feel about the language. Because when I'm writing, every phoneme counts, every every word counts, 
every syllable, every word, it, it's all part of, it, it's suffused with energy. I try to suffuse everything with energy, not subjects, but energy in the language. So the subjects go and come, but the energy is always there. You got that uh, geometric optometry. Yeah, geometric optometry is something you feel. It's not something you know. Henry Miller once made the statement that sometimes he wrote stuff and stuff down that he didn't figure out for some time. So it, it, it is magical and the voice, the voice comes into you. You just work with it. And you have to build that voice up as a nutrients. The, the life of a poet is, is one of nutrients, of experiences. You, whether you fail or succeed with the particular experience really doesn't matter. It means that you get a certain kind of a energy from that experience that can be channeled into language. So in other words, you're not owning the language. It, it owns you. It speaks to you rather than you speaking to it. I was uh, rereading Compression and Purity yesterday. And um, I wrote this really short acrostic poem that spells Will Alexander using some of your phrases and, and what your book told me. And uh, I wanted to share this poem, Will, as a segue into your next piece. Um, so this is, an, an this is acrostic that spells Will Alexander. Will Alexander is singing in magnetic hoofbeat, intergalactically painting a panorama of the cosmos. Longitudes of latitude liquidate ribosomes, locate the periodic table in his poems. Andromeda allocates Alexander and Dolphy's keys. Los Angeles Lafayette Park geometry generates rhapsody, culminating compression and purity. Xanadu accelerates the cycle of, of combustion all along the watchtower, word, sound, power, nocturnal notation, weaves, wills, Sri Lanka, and Luxodrome, doubling the kin kinesthetic indigo, Mineral alignment, energy vectors in his studious velocity, regions and rays resonate tributaries of imagination. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to do something. It's just called the deluge in formation. If one believes oneself as stasis, there exists no seepage, no neural density or scar. One then saturates as ash as pointless cannibals' lethargy is dislodged ink from a podium or a treatise. One comes to know demobility as a craft, as an arc which satis itself to specifics. Yet to know one's non-sequestered through mundane advancement as doorway or basic habit as speculation. I am speaking of chastisement or cross-referential superimposition. Within this condition, I am more like a crow from crucial underwater fires, a crucial underwater crow, neither Chinese nor Shinto, but of, black, of the black dimensionality as hidden underwater mass, which persists by daring, which seems at the surface a purposeless kinetic or a pointless mandrel's infection. Saying such, I consider myself a reddish Shinto crow, then just as strongly a black anathema crow, then just as quickly a sun-fed crow from snow-washed volcanoes. So I look to myself as winter, as inclement carrion monger, as flight through great electrical haze. I being blur who shapes the Empyrean, who invokes withdrawal, who instills in his forces stunning psychic transference. Man, well, we want to just we're already getting um, we're already getting some 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 good questions and some thoughts from folks. And uh, Pina has said um, that is, that is a relation between language and the senses. Could there be dormant senses that language cannot access because it has not tapped into knowledge that can accrue from them? Would your interest in shamanism consider this kind of possible gap? Yeah, I, I think yeah, that's a great uh, insight that she has there uh, because, yeah, I think that we're still evolving as beings. <clears throat> According to the uh, advertising agencies, we, we, we've been put into blankets of what we like. If we were 15 years old, if we're in nursery school, 
But you know that these things just tend to vanish when one gets insights into to reality or, or, or other levels of reality. Maybe that the American civilization and the Western civilization is a uh, adolescent structure when we really look at the whole situation. But this is something I try to explore in my next book that's coming out um, on Darrell Hickman. It's a book about the the, the original renaissance of, of the uh, West, which was in Granada mm-hmm. between 700 and, and, and the rise of uh, the uh, Spaniards in the uh, 14, after 1493. But anyway, I, I don't want to get into that mm-hmm. right now, but we're talking about an efflorescence of the mind where it's, it's able to build and leap all the uh, its former limits. Um, I'm interested in exploring beyond my limits. Well, that was interesting what you said about Granada and Spain because they had um, one of the world's first truly multi-religious cultures, right? In, in the, the for like well, they, 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 it was it was the, the, the key word is toleration. Oh. Because the toleration because the fact that the energy from the uh, You know that the toler- the tolerations from the energies was was included the Christians. It it, it didn't bifurcate from that, but it it, it 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 didn't exclude the Greeks, but it built on the Greeks, and they just didn't stay static with the Greeks because they created their own understanding of, of insight. The the typical this is with the Greeks, the Greeks, the Greeks. But what about the Egyptians in in, in this period of the uh, you know Muslim kingdoms? Do you, do you have any book recommendations on that history? Because I've, I've wanted to read about that time period in Spain, like you said, from about 700 to about 1493. I've, I've always been interested in reading more about that time period. That's an amazing period. I, I know that there's a lot of stuff. Uh, there's a book, and I can't remember the, the, the author's name now, but it's, it's an cr- incredible book called Islamic Technology. Mm. It has incredible information in it. And uh, it's 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 quite amazing. Wow! And uh, there's an essay by a, a gentleman named Jose Pimienta Bay who talks about the uh, uh, the seating of the Western universities: mm. Oxford, Salamanca, all of the above. You know, wow. and Oxford, Coimbra, all of those things were post this experience. In fact, <clears throat> this, this is what got me into writing about this. I know there's, there's many more beings that may be able to have more information about the areas, but I'll say it like this. The sun system was first seeded during that time period. Uh, Abu Said Sinjari, Zinjari, 1031. Wow. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but he seeded the sun system of Copernicus, but we never hear his name. We hear about Copernicus, 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 Hegel, this, but there, 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 there's problems with that. It, 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 in other words, we see that period as a blank period and nothing happened until the European Renaissance came, but European Renaissance was only basically is a painting era, is an era of painting because the Banu Musa brothers and the mechanics you know, the situation with, uh, you know, the, the mental illnesses that were already understood to exist and, and be diagnosed in, in the uh, 10th century. Wow. Wow. Insurance. I mean, if people didn't have to have insurance to go to the Bimartsons. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. These are hospitals and that the uh, you, you didn't need payment to enter the hospital to get treated. I mean, the cataract surgery, things like that already there but you know the european dates are always subsequent to that everything is subsequent to that and this is why i think it's been isolated and blanked out because of the fact that we want to see the european ideas is is the summit or the original uh kind of insight into different forms of knowledge that's hence the renaissance but the renaissance was always happening and, you know, and it was happening before, you know, and it happened during the Egyptian period. Wow. Because we, we need to know how the Egyptians and the, and the Chinese and 
and and and, and Islamic cultures connected in in uh, in China. There was this connection between Islam and China, which was was in terms of observation, astronomical observation. A lot of things going on there. Rich, rich period. But my book is is called on Dar El Higma, which is coming out from Africa World Press. And oh man, I, we, we, I'm getting far afield here, but you know it's coming up. This is an indigenous reading. I, I'm putting you already got that. me uh, got my interest up. I'm I'm <laughs> man. Um, Paul, yeah, Cunningham, I'm, I'm, Paul Cunningham had a question. Um, he said, "Hi, Will. How did the repeating image of the alabaster shark materialize in the combustion cycle?" <clears throat> the alabaster shark. Came up as is is Arabindo calls it an adesh. It's something that comes from inside of you, and it felt right at that moment to write it down. Now I wasn't thinking about some kind of historical references, but as is is a shamanistic a sh shamanistic figment that that rose in my imagination. Man, you know, we've already, we've gotten a couple other questions. Um, this is from Lebrecht Baker in Long Beach. Mr. Alexander, can you please expand upon or talk further about what you said? You're not owning the language, but instead the language owns you. Well, <clears throat> this is an idea that, uh, you know, that this has been here forever. And, and when Andre Breton talks about uh, language, he puts... He has a whole list of pregenitors. Uh, how do you say that? Progenitors mm -hmm. that that were doing this. I mean, amongst them, and Jonathan Swift and in Shakespeare, but also you have informational contexts that were not ideological, but included people like Garcia Larca, mm -hmm. and somebody is is uh, anti official surrealism as. Mr. Uh, Vallejo. Mm -hmm. Cesar stuff, Vallejo. Huh? Yeah, explosive stuff, man. Explosive stuff. So, you know, I, 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 I'm not ideological, but I understand where you get these natural elements from. It's like the dust that falls on the earth from outer space. You can't segregate. <laughs> man. So you can't, you can't segregate your reality. But this doctrine and that doctrine, this or that, but you have to uh, explore the energy, which which people, and you have to do it accurately, like a, a shaman does with plants, or, or people like in the the, the, the African, uh, the African American people that us, me, that came here from Africa, who were able to 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 tap into certain kinds of medicines. We weren't allowed to go to doctors, and so that that's a chat. Medicines from nature, I shouldn't say. I should say. So these are things that that, that you have to have from, from an internal base, not just some kind of external kind of uh, uh, prescription that you've been given. Because we weren't even supposed to learn how to read. So how do we survive? And we're continuing to survive off of this energy. I mean, it, 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 it's a natural kind of a thing. So language for me is my way of tapping into this energy. It's not something I'm just trying to intellectually solve or puzzle. So in other words, we, we want to just do these things. And what I could do is, is solve puzzles by, by natural, natural engagement. Mm. So here's, here's, and I do these, these puzzles and I try to solve them poetically. And this is a poem, a small poem from uh, Compression and Purity called Coping Prana. It is the way I breathe through chronic terrifying ferns, through a black ungracious stoma. It is this uranium rejoinder, this impact pointing backwards. And when witness causes observers to panic, to blur and forget and to flee. They can't see my approach, my wayward dorsal looming, my lettering and black drizzle. It's my approach, my weaving, my sigil as curved embankment. Therefore, I can never name myself or plot myself according to the sparks or the splinters from the workbench. Days 
ruthless with salivation, with my awkward insular roamings, I am like a few darkened eagles riveted against the moon. Then I'm brought to a table by deafness, feasting with herons, which spins me by embranglement, by incircular abatement, always seeking to have me nuded beneath my derma so as to talk to myself, so as to cancel my structureless scrutiny. They speak of me as lawless, as despicable, as a typhoon in a sea well, as tomorrow's, as the fixed and accelerated combination. They fix me as deserted, bereft, as fragment from a starving lion's compendium. I am considered as pointless positron without image, as hieroglyph, as sundial, as martyr, being leakage from a barbarous index province. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to... We're, 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 we're barbarous. In a certain way, I'm intellectually barbarous because I've never been able to conscript a neat linear compendium for myself ever. I learned things from different directions, circular, backward, going backwards, pointing, going to the forward. It, 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 it's not completely nonlinear. So because it's nonlinear, I was never able to subscribe to any real articulate combinations within the, the old educational structure. That's why I was glad to get rid of it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my mind doesn't work that way. Point by point by point by point. It tends to contain you. When you were at UCLA as an English major, what did you think of the poetry in the... In the um Poetry in the, uh, the Academy. Oh. You know, when I was doing that, I was reading this book on Arto <laughs> uh, <laughs> by Naomi Green. I think I can't think of the name of it right now, but it, it, it was a beautiful book, which I, I unfortunately don't have at this time. But I was being fed. I was understanding the basic tenets of surrealism during that period. Just, just on my own, and it, it seemed to conflict with what they were doing at that time, and hence my wires were crossed most of the time. And you were telling so me that Eric Dolphy and John Coltrane entered the picture at that time too, right? Oh well, they were there already, uh, but for me, but um, I learned about them when I was like thirteen years old, something like that. I heard a, a piece by, um, I heard Olay. I went. It was one of the first premieres of Olay in, in the radio here, and they have great radio here. But that, and I heard that, I couldn't believe it. I was just running around the room, listening to that stuff. And Dolphy on the flute. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's McCoy did this incredible solo on there. But you know, I was sinking all that stuff into my system, putting that into my nervous. I didn't know where I was going with it, but I just felt it. It was like a healing situation. So during boredom in school, I would write down the names of, of Roy Haynes, John Coltrane, Coy Tyner. And I ended up meeting everybody except Coltrane. But during, during my odyssey, you know, I've had a chance to contact these people, not as celebrities, but as energy fields. You had a long conversation with McCoy Tyner, right? Yeah, we were talking one night, one Monday evening at the old, uh, it, it was it was called the Adams West at one time. It was on uh, Crenshaw and Adams. And McCoy gave a concert. that He was playing over at the Lighthouse in Hermosa Beach, but he volunteered to do a free concert that night at, uh, on a broken down piano, and he made it sound great. <laughs> and we had a, just a good conversation about uh, John T. McLean's It Club. A lot of people don't know John T. McLean's Ed Club with, uh, you know, Hank Mobley, Train, Monk. There's a great record with um, uh, Monk at the Ed Club. Wow. It's on West, West Washington here in L.A. But McCoy didn't talk too much, but he, he we were talking about John T. McLean's running the numbers and, and, and the whole situation. People like, you know, the Ava Gardner, all these movie stars would come over to hang out. <clears throat> But, you know, it was, it was a hell of a... I, I never went. Unfortunately, I'll be honest. I, I was too young to go, but I, I, I always regret not 
that being there, you know, in that atmosphere, interesting atmosphere. West Washington was was quite a street at the time too, huh? And, and oh yeah, Western no, Kenshaw, West uh, Washington, all of that. Um, Adams too, right? Yeah, there's a lot of lot of energy over there. You know, like um, where it's on Florence and um, what's Florence and Western? There was a club on the corner. Right there on the corner, uh, on, on the east 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 side of uh, uh, of Western, and I can't remember the name of the club, but you walk by and Des Dexter Gordon would be playing there and stuff like that. Amazing stuff, and you know, it's, it's Coltrane always liked to play in L.A. And uh, you know, he and the first, I never went to the Renaissance Club, but that's where they got their. He and Dolphy got their first anti-jazz reviews from a concert they did here in L.A. Really? So it's just interesting stuff, man. Interesting, interesting city. But uh, we don't hear it about the official, from the official uh, point of view about uh, what's been going on here. I heard of Fela Kuti lived in L.A. in the early 70s. Fela Kuti lived here. People is like Fela Kuti, uh, Cedar Walton. Of course, the great Billy Higgins. Uh, you know, it's it, it, it's 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 it, it's a whole mix of things here. Dolphy, of course. You know, this is this is a whole mix of things, man. And that was those so, were your formative years, right? When you were coming up. Yeah, you know, he, he, that's what you do. Is what a poet does is live. He doesn't. He he or she doesn't structure a, a, a methodology for development. That's why everybody has different strengths, different kinds of pulls and ten and tensions that's why all the work is original work is always different different people have different ways of getting it at, at this energy so like the way that you grow a certain kind of a plant is not the same way you grow another kind of a plant <laughs> it has to be understood that way you know but see the educational system wants to put everybody in a box where they all grow the same for the same reasons this is why an unemployment page only has a certain limitation of what you what a the human being can do, and uh, this is something I don't I don't never s subscribe to. I can't because it's just like I said, like Bud Powell. This place says I can only play the piano. I can only do this this one way out of my originality. We had uh, two more questions. Um, Lebrecht Baker asked, "How did you get into writing poetry? What was your first aha moment?" And then Angela Scott, our librarian, said, Will, how do your interest and experience as a pianist and musician influence your poetry? Well, first of all, I play, honestly, I'll tell you, I play by feel, not by registration of, of, of notes like, like one plays con conventionally. But uh, I've had very fortunate experiences with, you know, playing with Bobby Bradford and, and spontaneous playing. And, and, and I play with other people and it, it tends to work because I hear, it's the hearing for me and, and, and the agility of the fingers. And I, I've been able to just take a nudge from, um, he was discovered, the piano player was discovered by Arnett Coleman, by the way. Uh, I can't think of his name. His, he, he played for ESP Records. And, uh, what's his, Davidson, Lowell Davidson. Lowell Davidson has given me inspiration, the piano player. But he was originally a chemistry major, I think, at Harvard. But he played the piano, only recorded one or two records. People like the great Hassan from Philadelphia, you know, people like that it inspired me, you know. Mingus is piano playing. By the way, I had a great experience where I did see Philly Joe Jones play the piano and the drums just one time. But just, just hearing these people gives you inspiration, just gives you inspiration. This is something that, that people don't understand, that they want to look at people, get autographs from them just to get things from them, but to, to absorb what they're doing, absorb what they're doing is, is, is important to me. It's more important and absorbing everything you can, the way you can absorb it, not the way someone else absorbs it. And you and uh, Kamal grew up together too, huh? Oh, yeah. The great Kamal. We, uh, 
we uh, share this this natural resonance that we don't see it, it, each other that much, but we 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 vibrate together, and it's like a, a natural situation, you know. In fact, we uh, I'm hopefully going to see him shortly. I hope he's on this broadcast, but you know, I'll I'll, I'll energies to you, man. But this is this is great, you know, to to have this vibratory current to talk to you and to experience some of these um these these, these histories but uh you know what i'm going to do now is um maybe read a, a a smaller piece and uh it's called a vibration from the what is it vibration from the uh, coast of india you know they're going through some rough times over there with the COVID, as as is all of the human race. But this is called "Vibration from the Coast of India" it's from the New Direction from the uh, City Lights volume. One feels its harried anodyne vultures, its populace of rats, its vexing by bubonics, the fact that the body is eaten as vapor, as base invisibility to be discarded, to be rinsed with carking polonium and lime. So there are basics intrinsically freed of themselves, of their dark extrinsic imperial patterns, as if the Holocaust body had never existed. They were peeking at fruition as claw or model or fragment. That's the fate in its ultimate de-existence that remains a galactic brewing formation never weighed by the cells or by measures invented by an onerous grasping of sorghum or principle. So to me, to vibrate the whole, the whole universe as it comes to you, not the way that you script it, but the way it comes to you, like India comes to me in a certain way, or Albania, which I wrote one day without knowing much about Albania. I began to read an article on Al Albania, and for some reason the poem began to appear about the dictator in Verhoja, who was an old Stalinist dictator that stayed for many years, from 1945 to many, many years. But you know, I got into this, this, I migrated to Albania and Albania, by the way, was off limits in the, in the old communist kingdom. It was, uh, it was non, non-Soviet based. It was, it was Chinese based. It's very strict and people had to, they transformed mosque into stables, things like that. People ate grasses like they do in the Korean peninsula. So it was Kind of like a critique of that that, that ideological spectrum. I, I didn't just take it in as whole soul and body. That they're, they're, they're this and they're that, and they have some ide ideological purity. But I just saw the, the humanity of the situation, and it, and it's like that humanity is the, the whole of reality. I should say is is part of of the the poet's experience. It doesn't have to just be be physical about something outside of your front porch, but it can be part of your your psychoneurological spectrum. So I'm I'm not ideological in that sense. Um, David Lau from Lana Turner Magazine just wrote. Um, I wrote an essay one time where I tried to compare Will's style to Dolphy, Coltrane, outward pushing jazz, free jazz, this very broad intellectual music in touch with many different places, times, knowledges, those musicians drew from a lot of different sources themselves. List of objects or adjectives, pushing sense, sound out, estrange it. From that's yeah. from Dave now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, Dave. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's an eclectic mix. Eclectic mix, man, you know. And you got to know where your feelings are, but you got to know how you fit into that situation accurately. It's like you're kind of like a, I'd say a poet is kind of like a mathematician. It's a mathematician. I was going to use a quote from Northrop Fry. If I can stand, get up and, and go get it. So One second. Sounds great. Will sounds great. Okay. 
Uh, I was just going to read. It just it just struck me. Oh, yeah, here it is. He says the poet is the poet, like the pure mathematician, depends not on descriptive truth, but on conformity to his hypothetical postulates. So that's what mathematics is. It's not an abstract situation, but it's a balance. It's understanding of balance. And that's what language does. You have to understand the balance and the sounds and, uh, and how the, 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 the colorations mix. It's like you, you're creating a certain kind of a invisible kind of formula all the time. So everything for me is, is like the essence is hearing, how you hear, not how you just know, but how you hear, how you feel about that hearing. People need that's to get their ears up, huh? Put your ears on, as they say. <laughs> you know, put your ears on. In fact, I was on a small TV program years ago with, with "Put Your Ears On" with the the poet um, uh, Bill Moore some mm -hmm. years ago. But you know, put your ears on. You know, and this is what I do all the time. Not just putting them on, but letting them stay on <laughs> after you evolve them. <laughs> this is the one thing we don't want to cut things down and truncate things. This culture is so designed to take away oxygen from life. They love chopping down trees and sculpting <laughs> this and sculpting that. And it's, it's allowing uh, reality to, to whiz in itself. Extraction, huh? Extraction and transactions? Extraction and transaction and profit. That's all you hear about. It's, 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 it's transactional trade. So... What I do is, is, is whatever I hear, I start to write it down. In fact, I just finished something uh, 48 hours ago because I heard it. And, and, and what, that's what the reading, your, your particular reading comes into focus because it allows you to draw from things when you begin to hear what you feel and begin to write it down. And, and, and the, 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 uh, the general knowledge is that you have, have that have impacted you begin to rise. And, and that doesn't mean you have to read everything on that subject at all times. You could just do that and just put down a, a regular notebook, a dossier on, on this and that, but it would be just completely linear and uh, deformed because it wouldn't have the feeling in it. That's what creates the poetry. It's the same language, but it's transmuted language. So this is what, it's like your total exercises of being. And so the combustion cycle was a complete exercise for me. It was not a literary activity, but a, a transmutation of, of, of the elements that I was carrying in myself. It's not like I was thinking about myself as an author, but as an experience. Mm. The names on the book, but, you know, it was something that was coming through me, not something that I was planning and plotting and putting into place where I could, you know, figure out my next, my next reading or my next presentation. None of that. Never, never, does, none of that occurs for me. Never. But uh, here's a small poem. It's just three lines. And I put as much energy into a poem. That's three lines is, is one that goes 600 pages. <laughs> the cosmos is fragment. A bell in a grotto, a sun with its flame riveted inside a salvo. Mm. Mm. So we're, 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 I'm not interested in just the size of something, but the quality of something, you know. We're, we're too hung up on sizes of books and how much you, how much quantity you know. But how how is the art that creates sculpts this information? How do you put these these things into concert? Hmm. There's a lot of people that were writing stuff with during Mozart's period, but as um, the jealous uh, musician. Um, what was his name? Salieri was talking about. Uh, in a, Mozart was magical. Mm -hmm. And so, in other words, the magic is out 
outside of the, the, the concentration of, of, of the, uh, the, the intellect as such, the cognitive mind, you know. And so he was railing against that. And Salieri was railing against this, this, this non-cognitive, this, improvis- this improvisation that, that, that Mozart was, was able to, to wander through and, and, and accelerate during his life. But, you know, for me, it's too much information has been created from the European utilitarian point of view. Too much. And we're inundated with this all the time. And if you don't do it like that, you're not considered to be intelligent. It's like you go into a store with your cell phone and they give you all these these. These, these shorthand informations, and if you don't pick them up right away, they don't think you're very smart. That's what happens in school. And, and it's, 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 it's debilitating because if you look at the uh, old Egyptian idea of the educational system in Luxor, which is, by the way, a Greek term, Luxor, but you, you, you were not graded. You were given degrees, you, you went by degrees of insight. And how you got into the inside of the cosmos, maybe through geography or astronomy or, or language, was, was another way of entering into your predilection for knowledge. Not to be just used as a, uh, uh exterior tool to, to put up something or, or match something with something else and it, it, for, the, for the moment, but to how you would irrigate your, your interior principle. And so that's what I'm interested in is irrigating my interior principle, not, not through the consciousness of the uh, exterior body. But I, I wanted to. Um, let's, yeah, let's do a little combustion. Yeah, let's do it like that. I'll, I'll do that way, man. Um, I have two quotes on here. Uh, one from, uh, yeah, thank you for doing that. Uh, is Amakar. Amokar Cabral says, over 99% of the indigenous population are untouched by the culture of the colonial power. Mm. And then there's one from the great Naeem Agbar. He says, despite the impressive technological advancement of modern Western man relative to his own history, he ranks far behind the African people of Kemet Egypt, both technologically and spiritually. Part of the reason for this mental devolution is the limited conception of human potential that one finds in Western science. Mm. Uh, That's that's what it was. The the, the security agencies have this term called uh, cognitive anomaly, where they can only go so far. But everything is based on superimposition. But what, what we want to do now is to uh, be able to uh, go into the uh, economy, to, to this beyond the anomaly, into this this other script of levels. And uh, let me start reading. It's, this is this is the voice of, of an Angolan shaman, which is which is related to the African old African. Sangoma, the Sangoma heals. He doesn't, he doesn't overstate just his technical uh, abilities. And there are technical ability, uh, abilities in this, in this region of the earth, but they're never, they're never championed or uh, lionized, according to the West. He says, I of the electrocuted hamlets, of the transfigured remnant of inclement nostrums subsumed by swirling electron soils. I work by means of solar isolation, by means of combustive subsonic, by means of cryptic soma and bird. Trying to yield by figments, a world beyond eras, a world with inner magnetic hydroxyl, commingling with outer suns, with the electrical motion of distance through altarity. And it is because of this distance that I've been claimed by the ambiguous, 
by dynamic hesitations, being both kinetic and counterkinetic, by a catharsis which arises through subfervor and vacuum. Me, I've hovered within uncountable disorder, yet I've flown like a bird from stunning iguana transposures by blood type channeling through strange charisma and error. I've never been able to reason from induction or hold my mind point by point according to mechanics accrued from traumatic incendiary counting. My difference understanding by the equator as absence of mass outside the realm of fecundity as abstraction, as if absorbing by means of supraphysical infusion. Because I sometimes waver in my gait, I am accused of being flawed, of being a curious subcelestial avian, unable to fly or descend, according to tenets which focus themselves through universal reason. Because I'm not of the conscious body, I am focused by osmotic planes, by riddling annulus, by levels known in certain parts of the world as a sapient issue. By mingling in private, I've come to know certain aspects of being through transrooted fields, through roots and waves of vertigo, through imploded species of deer, and the political subsets and the random holograms of speaking is where the sun onerically swims, where the galaxy intrinsically lights and suggests. This being the shaman's hieroglyphics, the oneric glass and the genes, sometimes stumbling in a shaken vitreous house, peering through a porthole of integers, as if the numbers were formed by an unbalanced wheat or an interior chart burning with a folio of diamonds. The rhetoric of the sun, associational gulfs, empowering my soma as a chain charged Iranian warren, not worn predictable as ideology of mist, but as resonance, as a relay of bells over vast projections beyond limit. And this limit being nothing other than the consciousness of limit, of thinking of oneself within the prediction of that limit. Therefore, phantoms, they being limit as being, and projected limit as being, therefore I exist as numerology, as circle, as a combined four suns being a great astrology of rivers. And these suns and rivers by breathing, by gnomic scattering and burning, create by magnification momentums of tension, fractals, apositional soils, summoning codes beyond cellular inculcation. Because I have only been judged by limit, by a Coleman fragmentation, I remain obscure, pillaged by extrinsic determination, by untoward utility, practice as imprisoning code, no longer of the overtone of the galaxy as living obscurity. I'm thinking of the common obscurity of eras, of figment, the monological stream of the Permian, partaking of the fire before the earth was settled. Ironically, this becomes a curious fragmentary solace, a mode, a discipline, an energy. Being a singer in a hostile ozone field, I've come to terms with gregarious isolation, the tumult within various salts within the horizon. Because I am without definitives, without the dictums which sculpt the categorical, I seem de-energized, contracted, suspended as possibility as enigma, as stray, as that which transmutes an abstract catharsis. So as molecule, as some, by conscious numbering, I'm placed in this or that projection as a priori plaintiff, as precarious ideology. I no longer bicker with my own bereftness, crafting myself by judgmental folly, by a self-writhing plot bound by sacrilegious determination. True, my biology function, I've been given the craft of breathing and at times 
I monitor waves in my system. Not in the sense of counting or declamation, but as pro precipitates, 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 as trance, as solar lake and its sigil. These being waves which flow from the summer, like a hatching of novae or butane apparatus. I am not the order of hives or buffeted within neurotic changeling hectares, which then dissolve through forces which dwell in central illusion. Because I am immersed in the upper, in the counting of the upper and lower Egypt, I know the expansion of the Sumerian sun being active in entry through Mayan stellar portals, which means I am connected to the human solar center. And this solar center, which articulates, which animates the soma to the powers which dwell in the galactic central furnace, which issue resonant psychic fuels as coruscating stamina and each species being part of the stamina. For instance, the ants burning, revealing themselves in depths of, psych of psychic alps, being citric metamorphics, engaged in rhetoric beyond the potential of human flair or quanta. All the levels reconveyed and drowned and reignited within a havoc of instance, within three billion suns, acting as reverse rotation, this being the algebra of primeval protozoans in the, within the flag, flank of fiery brachiopods, within the forms of odoriferous stellar algae. I speak through inverted hagiography or the varying utility of particles, inscribing laments as a scorching motility, as a sand which crosses junctures, sired in the ethers, as continuous heliopause. Certainly this is minus the politics of the ozone, which rises subverted dust and virgins, inversions, dissolved as blank electrical waste, as events which hover as omnivorous horizons. Now as bird and proto-bird, again as a blank conducting principle, I come to language as interior diorama, triplicate, massless, swimming as a form through seasonless upper darkness. This being the ether at the pole, touching on the nearest vertical light, being cobalt in the conscious mind, being the symbol of eagles, diving through subsurface anopsias. This being the inner level, the fields within fields, these being the curious cycles of ethers and suns and kings and blue tornadoes as bodies, being transpicuous fuels combined through magical inhalation of the sun. This is the way the sun breathes. This is the way that the seminal unfolds. Thus, the body being fractal in rotation remains alive by ophthalmology, by audition, by schist, which rotate as carbon. Therefore, I am called by some Aguirre de dos Santos, the seeming avian harried at the interdimensional as crossroads where the cells seem blinded, where the thoughts seem dazed by ceasing to assemble. I could easily speak of the birds of Mozambique or of the winds that burn in the Eastern Sahara, my skin seemingly brewed by Angola and Brazil, by schisms which generate angles and currents, by fjords of the moon which collide and magically structure the invisible. I'll stop at that point, but... Thank you, Will. Yeah, yeah. It uh, goes on and on, but just to give a part, a little part of a part of a part, because everything that you do is connected to something else. It's always circulating. This is one of the things that this culture doesn't understand, that they got everything parted up to this, parted up to that. And if you get rid of this, you get rid of that, and you'll stop something. But it doesn't ever stop anything. Life does not stop. 
They just found a um, son that was, whew, I think it was uh, 110 times, how can I say? Now, this planet was 110 times further away from the sun than is Earth. And was still part of the system, you know, part of the solar system. So you get some bizarre informational complexes going on in this universe that that have not been accounted for. And we don't know how they got there. We can speculate, but we really don't know how they got there. And then we, we have to do that with ourselves, even though we have names and we have dates and you know, this and that. But we don't really know. We kind of rely on what people sometimes tell us about what we are. <laughs> and that gets us entangled even further. Well, you always help me um, see a, a little bit further, see further down the line and, and see the, you make the invisible visible. And um, thank you for expanding, expanding the lens and, and just opening it up. And thank you so much. Yeah, that, it's, not, it's not a personal thing, but we want to spread it out so we can share with one another. If one so, person can, yeah, it's, it's that's what we want to do is share. We're all interconnected, right? It's all interrelated. It really is. And it's not like some kind of you know, namby-pamby situation, but it's really true. You see this thing going on in nature all the time. And it, it, it's stuff that's being discovered right now. That's, it's unbelievable. I do give the, 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 the informational complex of sciences is fantastic because of what's, what's being discovered now, like under the ice caps and, 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 and the extra, I think it's over 4,000 exoplanets we, we're working with now. Terrence Butcher says, good to see Will again after all these years. Oh, good to see you. I'm glad you came and I thank you for being here to listen. You know, I'm trying to share with, and this medium is so crazy. I mean, to me, I mean, to be able to just talk like this and share with so many people. But I'm, gr I'm grateful, cycle, everybody. <laughs> I'm grateful for having this this uh, this uh, you know opportunity. But you know, we just want to just spontaneously connect because we want to know that it's kind of like the old thing of putting a, a palm in a bottle and then letting it ride across the waves. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for this amazing conversation today. It's been truly, I don't have the words, you do. <laughs> it's been amazing. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your time and for your generous support of poetry and our Long Beach Public Library community and the poet community at large that's visiting us today. I mean, we have people from potentially all over the world. It looks like we've got people visiting from Italy who want to who want to see this program once it um, once it goes onto our YouTube page and I just want to remind everybody that um, if you have people who would like to see this um, or if you want to see it again um, it will be posted on our LBPL YouTube page within the next week or so as soon as we can get it edited um, and posted so I will be sending out an email to everyone with um, your uh, you know, with the emails that you signed up with via Eventbrite. If you haven't had a chance to sign up, if you didn't sign up via Eventbrite and you got the link from somebody else, like I said in the chat, please submit your um, email address here so in the chat so I can make sure to get it to you. And um, Will, uh, when, when, will um, the Brecht Baker wants to know, do you have any other talks scheduled that, that we can share with everyone here? Oh, actually, I'm doing one tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll send it out. And uh, it, it's it's a lot of stuff going on right now, but I'll I'll, I'll make I'll send it to you, and then maybe you can. Yeah, I'll, I can send it to the Brecht, and I can I can send. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'd also like to thank just a little quick thank you to our library administration and staff, friends of the library, our Long Beach Public Library Foundation, and so many other local contacts, including Mike Songson. Um, thank you for helping to set this up for us today. And Mr. Alexander, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, it's been truly incredible. And I knew nothing about surrealist poetry before I, I started listening to your uh, program and reading about you in advance of this. So it's truly been an eye-opening experience, not only for me, but for many people. And it will continue to 
um, educate and enrich the lives of people all across our community and um, further afield who are able to tune in online and see this later. So we just really want to thank you. Our sincerest thanks and appreciation to everyone who was able to attend today. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening, everyone. Um, stay safe and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you again soon at our upcoming Miller Room programming. Thank you so much again. And did Mike, did you have anything you wanted to say or Mr. Alex? You know what? I, I, I want to tell everyone to get the combustion cycle and Compression and purity, and singing in magnetic hoofbeat. Um, and the new book coming soon will be Refractive, Refractive Africa. Africa, correct? That's from New Directions. And when is that going to be published? Well, that's going to be coming out in November, and um, we also have a companion a publication uh, from the new uh, uh, Granta imprints in England, and that that'll be coming out at the beginning of of twenty twenty two. Oh, wow. Wonderful. So, yeah. So prolific. It's amazing. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Angela. Thank, Yay, you, thank you, everybody, for joining us. This has been truly an amazing experience. And we're just thank so you for everybody's interest. And, in, uh, you know, I'm going to sign off now, but thank you for everything. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks again. We'll see continued. you soon. Thank you, Bye. Will. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.